This whole city is like a timeline. It goes from east to west. In the east, we, uh, the city was established. So that's what, the reason why we have the Oriental style in the east. The more west you go, you will co come across this like Western European style. Typical for Austria-Hungaria mm -hmm. and all that. The more west you go, you'll come across the communist mm -hmm. style. And then the more west you go, you will come across the 21st century buildings, more or less. This is about the first world war. This is where the assassination happened. First Europeans got really crazy in those times. We had so many military pacts, like military alliances. Uh, one of those alliances was, for example, the Russian Empire, the U United Kingdom, France and Italy. The second alliance was Austro-Hungary, uh, Germany, uh, Ottomans, and a little bit later Bulgaria also. Uh, literally, we always say everything was prepared for that First World War to happen. Just that little flint was needed for the war to be triggered, actually. Yeah. That little flint actually happened here. What happened here is that, like, Balkanian people, we, as Yugoslavians, this is where the idea of Yugoslavia was born. A lot of people actually think that the idea of Yugoslavia was born after the Second World War, but the idea was after the First World War. Why? Because the local population here we really actually got uh, like we started finally to think to get the consciousness about our identity and all that because for 400 years we were occupied by two bigger kingdoms the Ottomans and the Austro Hungarians. Something that you can see by the infrastructure and in architecture, the influence, you know. Uh, after 400 years, we finally think with our heads, how I like to say. So the idea was to weaken the Austro Hungarian kingdom. Uh, the best way to weaken the Austro Hungarian kingdom would be actually to kill the successor, to kill the prince, someone who is going to be the next on the throne. Of course, that's that's. Like after the train, we got into this one. This is a convertible, you can see. The belly doesn't have a roof, so whoever was in the car was pretty unprotected. It was pretty exposed to the public. Actually, on this picture, this is one picture, uh, the real picture from the, from the First World War. You can see the, his wife, his wife Sophia, and him in the back. Also, you have here these two guys. This was like the head of the security, and this was the governor of Bosnia inside of the Austro Hungarian kingdom. You know. uh, but pretty exposed. So, the idea of these assassins it was actually to like the car would go along the river to the city hall to that building that I'm gonna show you later. It's literally towards your hotel. Mm -hmm. They would do some kind of ceremony there and the plan was to go back in the same street but on their way back to the train station. We already said nothing goes according to plan. Uh, two attempts happened. The first attempt happens when the car was going from the train station to the city hall. So in that direction, the first guy threw a bomb at the car. He thought he had the best chance, but the bomb bounced off the car and exploded in the street, wounding a couple of people. For the prince, for Franz Ferdinand, it was quite important to continue like nothing happened, because if you make any kind of panic in the society, you'll, you'll make the Austro-Hungarian king, you would make the Austro-Hungarian kingdom actually to, like to look much weaker in front of our community. You know? and that's what the goal was the whole thing. So they continued with the ceremony and they started to go back. Now this is where this unexpected turn of events happened, where the car, the driver of the car, he decided to turn into this street. A lot of people mix the bridge with the real assassination place. The real assassination place is actually over there, as you can see. Uh, the car turned because the driver made a mistake. It's, it's extremely funny how the driver, like he was not in on it, uh, the driver was not uh, paid for it, he literally made a mistake. When, when he realized what he did, these cars needed a lot of time to switch the gear into reverse and all that, you know? So that was enough time for Gavrilo, Gavrilo the assassin, the real assassin, his primary objective was to be at the bridge, you know? 
but because he was, he, that was his primary objective, but because he was too scared to to do the assassination, which would be his first time to kill anyone, he was hiding in this building that was something like a coffee shop, candy shop, you know. And like his goal was just to get away from this world, so he wouldn't do it, you know. But of course, the car turned and he didn't expect it. The security forces were not as cautious as they would be because they thought that all of these assassins were on the route. That's the whole thing. Uh, so Gavilo decided actually to exit this uh, coffee shop. He stood there and shot a few shots. One bullet went to the neck of Franz Ferdinand. The second bullet went to the abdomen of his wife, Sophia. Now, Sophia is actually, uh, she was pregnant, that's the mm. whole thing. So, he actually, when we think deeply about it, the assassin killed the two next generations, actually, of the dynasty, which of course made a big, big, big mess in the, in the whole Austro-Hungarian kingdom, you know. And also Hungarians, they actually accused Serbia of the, doing this assassination. So they gave the ultimatum to Serbia. Uh, the ultimatum was for Serbia to to actually enter the full investigation of the... Uh, the ultimatum was for Serbia to do the full investigation, like to participate in full, in the full investigation of this attack, and also to suppress or reduce any anti-Austrian anti activities in Serbia. 30, 30 days after this, this is when the assassination happened. 30 days after this, the Serbia, like the Serbia, so that's when also the was actually with the pact with the UK and the Russian Empire and the whole of the First World War. We always say to change the world order here because even today you can feel some autonomous regions and in certain countries. The, those are all the consequences actually of the first world war. So they they blame the Serbian? Was the assassin Serbian? He's a Christian Orthodox. Yeah, he is from the organization called Young Bosnians. But this person, their allies were the, the, like the, the people from the organization called Black Hand. And this Black Hand was, for example, or, uh, in, in Serbia. So, but more or less after that, we had the kingdom, it was called the kingdom of Serbians, Croatians and Slovenians. And later it was actually renamed into the kingdom of Yugoslavia. If you ask me, if you analyze the political system of Yugoslavia, uh, it was actually quite interesting because mostly, uh, I don't know, as I said, it was all about making the middle class the biggest class, you know. Now, was that good? It was. It was for for every every living nation. This kind of political system works. That's the whole thing. You know? uh, the transition here from socialism to democracy, for example, it was pretty hard on people because people don't know who, who they're gonna vote for, <laughs> more or less. Uh, so people still, we still had that generation gap. Let's go here. Where, where like older people are not used to voting, so they always vote for wrong people, you know, <laughs> unfortunately. So that's why we have bad politicians and all that. Uh, younger people don't want to vote. That's called second. <laughs> That's the whole thing. Uh, so I don't know, we'll, we'll see, but like, yeah, a lot of people here are forcing the like social democracy, which is like socialism and democracy uh -huh. in one. The, mi the middle class, the biggest class, but still you have the, some certain rights that it's democracy, like uh, freedom of speech and all that. Because in Yugoslavia, I didn't really have like the freedom of speech, even though it was the best country here in, you know. You know, like try to say something against your president and you would see what would happen. Uh, the first mosque of Sarajevo ever. I mean the whole thing about this mosque is that we sometimes say this is one of the first like modern buildings of Sarajevo. This building was built in 1450s. 
1457 to be exact. The mosque is called Sultan El uh, Mehmed El Fatih. That Fatih or Sultan Mehmed, that means that he was like the conqueror, Mehmed the conqueror. He conquered all the lands. He was the one that extended the Ottoman territories the most, you know. Uh, like in the, especially in the 15th, 16th century, that was the peak of the Ottoman Empire. They were actually spread out on three different continents, Asia, Europe, uh, Africa. They literally had the whole coast of, uh, of the Mediterranean Sea, more or less, you know. But of course, as the years went, they got weaker and weaker. I mean, not every this is a big valley. Mm -hmm. It's a big field surrounded by mountains, you know. And the first buildings were, as I said, the mosque destroyed by Rosla Hungarians so a little bit later. And all of these traders that would come here, from these hills and all that. The first thing that they would see from the hill would be a castle in the valley. So when you travel for Yevo, it actually means a castle in the valley. Even though it would be a bit spontaneous, because I always say this was never meant to be a city. This was literally established by the Ottomans because of, a, uh, of the good geographical position. They saw a really good potential here for the trading. Imagine this is a map, you know, you have Istanbul, you have Vienna, you have Sarajevo in the middle. So we always say Sarajevo was like a middle man for, between east and west, how we like to call it here. This is that city hall I mentioned, this is where that ceremony happens uh, uh, that's related to the First World War, of course. Uh, what's, what's, what's the whole thing? What do you think? What's your opinion on this building? Like, what do you think? Was it built during the Ottoman times or Austro-Hungarian times? Does it have the Oriental style or Western European? It's kind of got a little mixture of both. Handshake for me, <laughs> that's the right answer, actually. This is like a true question that I ask everyone, uh, because nobody can guess the answer. Everybody says it's either Ottoman. Uh, if I get the people a little bit that come from a little bit more from the East, they will tell this is 100% Western European, but it's both styles. What's the whole idea, actually, of this building? Uh, I mean, it was built by the Austro-Hungarians, you know, around 1890s. Uh, the idea was to make the first governmental building of Sarajevo, you know, the building for the governor of Austro-Hungaria. But when the architect came here, the whole thing was that he saw the surroundings, the environment, and he realized, well, everything around is oriental so it would be pretty unesthetical to build one typical western european building he actually made right. this kind of we call this sarajevan style this kind of style doesn't really have a name the closest style to this but only because of the colors the closest style to this is moorish style yeah. like in southern spain northern africa but it's not moorish it's just closest to, to moorish you know uh, later this was a library during the Yugoslavian times uh, of course, like this library contained two millions of books, many manuscripts, many trading agreements that proved the Bosnian existence in the past. Unfortunately, do during this last war, one artillery was shot from that hill up there, straight into the building, and because everything was flammable in the building, the building burned. Mm -hmm. And we were not really sorry for the building, but more for what was inside of the building. Right. I metaphorically always say we lost our identity by burning the building, you know, because a lot of historic facts were burned. This building was also like an archive, you know, during those times. But now it's a city hall. Now this is where our mayor is. Mm. City councillors, mayor, and, and, and city officials. It's not really cool. just a cable car, but for us it's more sentimental. Uh, it's more sentimental because for us, it represents the Winter Olympic Games. From, oh, 19, sorry. Yes, yeah. from 1984, every mountain around is considered as the Olympic mountain. So this mountain, for example, was used for the Bob train, Bob Sledge train. Yes. The first cable car was literally built in 1984, but it was destroyed during the war. So we had to rent it. So as I said, this was never meant to be a city only a trading post with religious freedom but a lot of people started to move in so that's the reason why you see 
you have probably seen a lot of neighborhoods around the hills. And that's the whole thing, because only here you could have the commercial zone. Just, like, they never made some kind of plan for the residential zones, because mm. they never thought that anybody, anyone would move in here. But the people liked this religious freedom, and because they were not allowed to move in the valley, they moved in the hills. So that's the reason why I have a lot of neighborhoods around. So the commercial zone was the valley. Now we're entering this, like, trading post, this commercial zone of the old town. Uh, it's called the Chashya. Chashya in translation means the market. Market, uh, this specific street, it's not official, but I call this street the food street. Yeah. Uh, this is more or less because every second shop is some kind of restaurant or <laughs> a coffee shop or something like that, you know. Uh, you'll see the street names. Every street name is related to the type of shops in the street. For example, the next street we're gonna visit, it's gonna be called Kazan Jiluk. Kazan Jiluk in translation means the copper street. Craft with copper was pretty present here, and every craft here, believe it or not, actually goes from knee, that's how we're seeing, from knee to knee. That means from generation to generation, from father to son, you know, or mother to daughter, it doesn't matter. Is, uh, mm -hmm. is the copper from the mountains local or is it brought from? Important, believe it or not. And I'm gonna tell you an extremely interesting story how these copper smiths survived during the war. Because they had to make some kind of stuff with the, you know, with, uh, with the copper, mm -hmm. but they didn't have the money for the copper. So you'll see the improvisation. <laughs> ah, you can see Kazan Jilu Ulitsa, Street Kazan Jilu. Kazan means copper, Jilu means street. So as I said, every every street. You can see actually there is some coffee. There is some coffee inside. Okay, uh, what is the whole thing? Now, the coffee culture is pretty present here. I don't know if you have seen it or not, but it's oh, pretty yeah. present. Uh, we were always traders. We were not doing any physical work anyhow and in, at, at any time. So we were just trading, drinking coffee. You'll see even on a lot of paintings, still people are smoking a lot of pipes and all that. Just like today, everybody smokes cigarettes here, it's, you know. Uh, these smaller ones, a lot of people ask me, they're not for coffee, they're for salt and pepper, for example. If you're gonna buy anything in these like streets, I don't know for how many days you'll be here. Just to let you know, this is not Turkey, so there's no bargaining. Everything has a fixed price. Everything has a fixed price. So there's no, like, there's no discount, but there's no also ripping off. Nobody's gonna rip you off, but they're also not gonna give you any kind of discount. <laughs> Uh, if you have here, uh, I like this kind of shelf because it has a little bit of everything. Because you can see even on the top shelf over there you have the menorah. You have a little bit of everything from every kind of community. Islamic, Catholic, Jewish. That's the reason why I like these kind of shops. They make everything for everyone. Uh, just to let you know that the craft, everything has to be handmade. So the price, how the price goes, the price, what affects the price, the amount of details. The more time he invested into engraving and all that, the more expensive it is. If it's just like, for example, of, of course, this part would be pretty cheap. If we would enter there, you can see more decorated ones, like how they have the different engravement. They're like the more expensive ones, actually. That's, that's the whole thing. So they're not allowed to do it by machine? I mean, they can, but it's not the tradition. Okay. So it has to be, and you can hear the banging, you'll see, hear it later. Mm -hmm. uh, this is what you, what you saw, actually, the tanks. The tanks, uh, yeah, the tanks. <laughs> you know, because like when the war, there, we had the war, you asked me if we had the copper, we don't have the copper, as I said, we import. But during the last war, we didn't have the money for the copper, because these families still stay in, the, in these shops. They came with an idea 
to go actually around the hills and to find the real bullets and <laughs> artillery shells. You can see it's a real artillery yes. shell uh, to, to, to make souvenirs out of these actually. A lot of people, will, a lot of coppersmiths will tell you here that this was actually uh, like the first people that bought these kind of souvenirs. It was actually the the UN peacekeepers. <laughs> and that's the whole thing. So you can still see on here, it's got a word of firing in it. <laughs> yeah, 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 yes, it's 12 yeah. 7 99. But uh, right. do you know what's the purpose of this now, for example? Whistle? Yeah, it's Australian. Oh, bottle, can opener. Bottle opener, that's right. Uh. It's so simplistic, but so yeah. like, you know, so useful. This would be, this would be a these. We actually like to uh, like this kind of symbolism from this, because this killed people before. Now you put water, put soil, put you got flowers, life, you know. So it's more like some with some kind of message. That's that's why I like it. You know? Some people are terrified by this, but you know, for us, it's it's the part of history. We cannot we cannot deny it. You know. This queer, it's called the bus chasha. Bus chasha means the main market. So this would be the first place that the traders would visit, actually, uh, when they would come from the hills and all that, when they would see that castle in the valley that I said. Uh, now, because this was one of the busiest places, so. now the fountain had two purposes, actually, believe it or not. One purpose, of course, you know, they would come thirsty from the long trips and all that. But the second purpose was actually to give them directions to certain streets, to certain areas, to certain accommodation. Uh, in, uh, I always say that uh, like every city has the tourist info center, we actually have the trader info center. That was the whole idea of this building. You can find a lot of these fountains along the road between Sarajevo and Istanbul, in the Balkans actually. But you know why is this one the most important one? Because this is the only one that actually has the preserved market around. And because of this preserved market, like the whole market is whole commercial zone. And because of this preserved market, this is a UNESCO protected area right now, actually. Um, there is actually a myth that says, when you drink from the front, you'll come back once more to the city. If you drink from the other side, You'll actually find love of your life and stay here, but I suppose it's a little bit too late. Too for late that. for me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. but I can still drink from the front. Yeah, you can still drink from the front. <laughs> yes. Uh, tap water drinkable here. I don't know if I mentioned, but when you have a lot of mountains, you have a lot of water. Fire stone. Ah, yes. Yeah. I mean, of course, all the water goes through the stones, mm -hmm. filtrates through the stones, and picks up the minerals. Right? Because pigeons, uh, for us, represent peace. Now, a lot of people tell me only white pigeons represent bees and all that. <laughs> For us, uh, every pigeon represents bees, because in this last siege, uh, that was the first and the last, I mean, the first and the only time, actually, uh, when, when the pigeons escaped from the city. Because the UN statistic says that during the siege, every 11 seconds, it kind of short shot or explosion in the city. So all of those loud noises, Ch chased off the birds, yeah, from the city. When the war finished, they came back, so for us they have a meaning because they indicate peace. I always actually joke with people from the Netherlands, because the people from the Netherlands are always complaining about the pigeon. Uh, but you know, when you see when you see a pigeon on your balcony, you know, peace today, it has no price, more or less. Before, I, I was saying, like, the peace is really expensive, but now I'm seeing but this kind of texture, you see this colorful texture, mm -hmm. that's our thing, like the Bosnian texture of the carpet. 
You know how the Persian carpets are? Sure. A little bit more red. Ah, uh, this is we have typical. Yeah, this is yeah. this would be a typical Persian carpet. If it if it was a, a brighter red, it would be a Turkish carpet. For example, that with red and blue would mm -hmm. be a Turkish carpet. This would be a Persian. This one would be our our texture of the carpet. It's more like a mosaic, as you can see. But what's so specific about our texture is that it's extremely colorful. It's all about the mixture of colors. Uh, so that's that's something that stands out in, in our culture. Same yeah. as the one in the middle? Yeah, just like that, yes. Just like that one in the middle. That's the first thing. This kind of place, what this place was actually? This place was... Uh, it was one inn. You know, I N N in mm -hmm. for these traders that will come here. Now we as traders, like we as the ones that did the trading, we realized how to make a lot of money, of course, by trading. I mean, by doing more trading. If you're gonna do more trading, you need more traders. By having more traders, you need more accommodation. You need more. Uh, oh. Uh, so, yeah, uh, more or less all of these rooms were, let's go to this way, uh, all of these rooms were the rooms for those traders, actually. Uh, what, what was the whole thing? What's the catch? What brought trading here? The catch was that we would give three days and three nights accommodation but free of charge free of charge and of course that every trader that would go from Istanbul to Vienna or Vienna to Istanbul they would actually come he here for, yeah, for that reason actually you know uh, and this is kind of like some kind of exhibition about calligraphy uh, the art because you know in Islamic culture you cannot really put real pictures right. so for example this is like a horse you can see a horse made out of the uh, quotes from the Quran, from the uh, Holy Book of Islam, yes. Uh, so it's it's a really uh, interesting way of doing the art. Well, that's actually. really different, yeah. Mm. Uh, some kind of 3D illusion, yeah. something yeah. like that. Yeah. 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 So three days, three nights, three and two free meals per day. Of course, like every every trader would come here just because of that. Uh, how this place worked, you saw that place where the carpets are. Uh -huh. Those play, that place is actually, uh, um, it's actually, the, uh, it was, it's not anymore, but it was the stables for horses. Actually. So, uh -huh. you know, for example, the traders would go to that fountain, ask where is the nearest accommodation, and they would be sent here. You park the horse with your with the wagon or with the cart mm -hmm. that the horse uh, that the horse has, and then you go up up the stairs for your three days uh, accommodation free of charge. Pretty smart. Yeah, yeah, that's something that draws trading here. Like you can increase trading by a lot. Uh, actually, mostly it's 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 quite interesting how. By the end of the 90s century, we were considered as one of the wealthiest cities of Europe. But in the 20th century, we had three wars. The first, I mean, it was the first war for the First World War, which actually started here. The Second World War, you had the Nazi Germans, they absorbed some, some of the wealth also from the city. And then you had this war in the 90s, the siege that we're going to talk about later. It's oof, that even oof, that even made the, 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 the worst thing that confirmed all of these other wars. How I like to say, you know. So 20th century was pretty dark for this city, unfortunately. But we're getting back on our feet, you know, we're getting stronger, we're recovering from all that. We're entering the mosque. We are the first city in Europe to have the first electric street line. I don't know how much that is true, but uh, I, 
I mean, but a lot of people, a lot of people confirm it by the by the fact that we were the first ones to have a proper plant. You know? well, even these like uh, lamps, uh, some of the older families say that they are actually also from the Austro-Hungarian times. So, Austro-Hungarians, whatever they wanted to build in Vienna, they would first send their engineers here to test their capabilities if they're able to make something like that, okay. like electric grids, electric lines and all that. So Simmons, they proved to themselves that they're able to make this kind of stuff, you know. So the electrification of the buildings continued and a lot of mosques uh, became electrified. So a lot of mosques here are the first mosques with electricity, actually. The Walter, there was a scene where he was shooting from, from this hot cover and the Nazi Germans. If you remember the scene, maybe we watch the movie and this plate's gonna be pretty familiarized, uh, familiar to you because like the Nazi Germans were running across the shot in that movie and the Walter from up there is with the machine gun shooting at the Nazi Germans. It's all my water bottle. It's a sprint water. So it's pretty cool to watch out. Uh, as I told you earlier, the whole city is like a tiny. When you go from the east to west, the city gets more modern and modern. You can see how we're going towards the west, how the city is ch it's changing the style bit by bit. Uh, but I'll tell you more when you get to the meeting of cultures point. Uh, there's, it's not a good story. I mean, more or less, you're probably familiarized with the Grand Bazaar. Uh, this is, yeah, sorry. <laughs> it's probably like the modernized version of the Grand Bazaar. Why we say modernized? Modernized? Because when you look inside, look at the size of the ceiling. It's, yeah. it's more spacious than the typical Grand Bazaar. So it's more spacious, but at the same time, it has more organized shops. It's not all over the place. This is literally where we say we're literally like a place where east meets the west so if you look like this look like this you see narrow streets oriental style everything is more bright you know it's it's much brighter you would turn 180 degrees western europe <laughs> literally western europe <laughs> so interesting the cathedral what was the main goal i mean first to let you know every catholic church here it was built by the austro hungarians actually which means that every church was built after 18 typical for our churches it's called the neo gothic style this neo gothic style it's pretty much common in france for example Actually, even this church got the inspiration from Notre Dame. Notre Dame is the most famous church with this neo Gothic style, you know? I mean, it's not as massive as the Notre Dame, of course, but it's that kind of style, you know, that's inspired by that. So, of course, a different worship building from a from couple of blocks, literally. Uh, this is what I grew up with, the Ukrainian Orthodox Church. Yeah, 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 this is the typical, but you'll, you'll hear the story about this one. It represents the, the blood, the, more or less like the, I mean, the paint represents the blood, but of course it's not the real blood that mm -hmm. everyone thinks. The damage, you see this damage? Mm -hmm. It's a real damage from an artillery shot. Uh, Shrapnel? Yeah, you know how the fragments go, yeah. like the artillery hits the ground and the whole shot, the whole shell explodes into millions of little fragments. Actually, you could kill a lot of people with that. I'll tell you some of the statistics when we get to the tunnel about this, but definitely it's worth mentioning. Every rose represents the bloodshed. Uh, like the, at least 15 to 20 people were killed at this place by one artillery. And 300 of these fall on the city per day, actually. No, well, for you it's gonna be extremely easy to understand the whole thing, more or less. 
about the siege, about the war, especially about the siege. First, to give you the orientation like of where we are, where we went through, your hotel is actually over here, believe it or not. I said how the whole city goes from east to west. Mm -hmm. You can see how it goes. Uh, your hood, this is the old town and all that. Uh, so when we finish the tour, we finish the tour somewhere here. And we started to drive from here. We were driving like this, driving like this, driving like this. We went over here. This is where that roundabout was. Okay. Roundabout was over there. Then we went like this and then like this to the tunnel. So this is our route of the van. For you to understand a little bit the map, to give you the orientation of the map. You remember when I said the sniper alley? Can you recognize the sniper alley? This is like the closest area where the mm -hmm. enemies got into the city. Now, generally, to give you a little bit of the background, well, why this happened, how it happened and all that, the whole thing is that uh, the fall of Yugoslavia. Are you familiar Ross, with the fall of Yugoslavia? Yes. Have you heard anything about the fall of Yugoslavia from the previous tours, maybe? Just a little bit. Yeah. Uh, you probably know what happened. Tito died in mm -hmm. 1981. Uh, one mind that was controlling the whole country, the control was later given to the 60 different minds in the federal parliament of Yugoslavia. Of course, 60 minds, 60 ideologies, nobody is gonna, you know, uh, no, they were not getting along perfectly with each other, the politicians uh, from, from that parliament. So that's the reason why the nationalism started a little bit and, uh, and that kind of thing, thinking about the about the national identity. That's the reason why you now have these ethnic groups and three presidents and all that. Now, the war. So, of course, this whole fall of Yugoslavia started from Slovenia. Slovenia, when this nationalism arised in, in, in the parliament, Slovenia was like, we're not with this ideology, we're gonna leave this federation. And that's what they did. They left the Federation of Yugoslavia and of course they had some kind of war that lasted for a couple of weeks. Uh, nothing major, not many casualties, you know. The next country was Croatia. Croatia mm -hmm. was also with the same idea like why do you have the idea of like Great Serbia, of this and that. Uh, so, so what actually happened is that also Croatia decided to exit this federation. But they had a longer war than Slovenia, not as near Would you as like this Bosnia to be independent, you know. Majority of people signed yes, and we decided to declare independence. Now, of course, Serbians were not along with that idea, just like the Bosnian Serbs at the same time that were mostly located in eastern and northern Bosnia. The war in, Bo in Sarajevo generally starts over here. The whole thing is that these surrounding areas, the enemies, the forces, start to make some kind of checkpoints. Checkpoints on these roads. And they, bit by bit, they started to close the city from, from the outside, you know. Then our people realized what's happening and we were like, whoa, like we're, we're actually being closed, we're being circled around. Uh, and then big protests happened near the parliament, literally in front of that parliament of Bosnia that I mentioned. Some people say that even 100,000 people were on that protest. They were protesting against the war, actually. And then the random sniper fire started from the hills on, on those people. I heard some stories, bad stories, from the real people that saw that. It's like... They're standing, you know, and you see just people standing and falling down, you know, like it's people being shot, you know. Uh, so then people, and plus people didn't immediately realize that they are being shot at. So some time was needed for the people to actually see just people falling down, you know, randomly. Uh, then everyone started to escape from this parliament into the other parts of the city. Now, we were not prepared. Bosnia generally was like an industrialist country in, in Yugoslavia. 
even when you look at the flag of Bosnia inside of Yugoslavia, it's two chimneys. Mm -hmm. two, those two chimneys represent that industrialist thing about Bosnia in, in, in Yugoslavia. So literally the first people that had to go to the lines, the front line, it was the police and the hunters. We didn't have anyone else. The problem was with weapons and food. UN came, immediately made the airport as their uh, like base, UN base, but also at the same time they made this like a humanitarian bridge uh, where we would get the food and all that. But the biggest problem was that you couldn't really feed 500,000 people with two cargo planes. That's the biggest problem. Uh, plus you have to do the logistics from the airport to the whole city and you know how oh sorry yeah, straight, <laughs> sorry yeah. yeah and you know how i said the bosnian roulette that's that was something that we called the bosnian the bosnian roulette now of course you know uh it was the toughest so yeah now the war started in whole bosnia we're occupied it's not for us didn't have an army as such right but we call this like uh the free Bosnian yeah, army. Yeah, the, yeah, like the underground. The, the Bosnian army, which was literally spontaneously established for like the resistance army, right. how we resistance, like to say. Yes. Yeah, resistance, yeah. Um, now, yeah, so so the whole war in Bosnia started, the war started here. Uh, the biggest problem was that we couldn't get out from the city. This front line was 60 kilometers long. I don't know how many miles is that. About uh, 40. Yeah, 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 miles are actually smaller than kilometers. Yeah, about two-thirds. Oh, no, kilometers are two-thirds of a mile. Yeah. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So, something 40. like that. Yes, 40, 40, yes. Uh, so, yeah, so, to hold this kind of line without weapons, with uh, just police on the line, it was pretty bad. When, like... Six a six months to, to one year was needed for us to finally to finally have the idea of of to make some kind of idea of how we're gonna bring the supplies into the city because now we're under pressure. You know, a lot of people say that even this humanitarian bridge, even if you were lucky, you would get 160 grams of meal per day. 160 grams, that's right. like yeah. half of my breakfast right now, more or less, you know? Uh, so, it, and that was even if you were lucky. Plus the weapons, the problem was that the UN did embargo on weapons and they closed the whole, whole airspace. So we, did, we didn't get, like a lot of Americans also asked me, uh, why didn't we get the, like the supplies by the airdrops and all that? because of the closed airspace plus it was extremely dangerous for you and peacekeepers to be in the air because of the whole sniper fire and artillery fire here it's written serbian forces of course you know but i i don't really i hate propaganda so like this is not wrong but at the same time we were officially attacked by the yugoslav national army but the problem is that the last country that was left in that Yugoslav National Army Serbia. was Serbia. <laughs> and that's, that's actually the whole thing why this is written like this, because everyone that comes think, oh, it's propaganda, blah, blah, blah. But it's just fa factual, it's, it's a fact. You know? uh, yeah, so then first people, what they did is they started to run across the runway. You didn't have the tunnel. From one side to the other side, and people started finding to have commit communication in between that with that communication people start to get already uh, like finally got the idea of you know what we actually need to improvise somehow uh, this was the free Bosnian territory so they used the UN base as the best opportunity to use it as a cover for this tunnel so we can get the supplies from that mountain that's that mountain that I showed you over there this is that free bus in territory so you can see how you how you had these trading routes some of the supplies came from our factories in the middle of bosnia that were not affected by the war some of the supplies came from croatia as you can see by land uh, it would all gather here then through the tunnel and then it, over here the biggest luxury you know what was the biggest luxury 
cigarettes and coffee. Yeah. <laughs> it was not food at all. Uh, cigarettes and coffee. I'm gonna explain the price change over here. So, for example, this is where the that pack would be like. Like here, it would be two euros. Here, it would be maybe six euros, ten euros, fifteen euros, twenty euros. So the deeper you go, the more expensive it gets because of the bigger mm -hmm. risk yeah. to get the supply because of that Bosnian roulette, more or less. You know. Especially, uh, the biggest problem was if you lived in the old town. For my family, for a lot of families in the old town, we're still highly respected there because of what we survived, more or less, during those times. Uh, because old town was the deepest area in the besieged city so to get supplies mostly how it would work one family member per family would go maybe once per uh, once per two weeks to the tunnel actually get supplies and get back the biggest fear was if your family member doesn't uh, if if the family member doesn't uh, come back yeah. in two days because you never know if he's gonna get shot and you're not notified right. you have zero flow of information no electricity no radio nothing literally you know. uh, so it was pretty bad the idea of this sniper ali was to continue to cut the city into two halves you know so it would be so this part would like surrender and all that uh, the problem was that the Yugoslav National Army it was the third largest force in Europe. They had infinite weapons, like armory, infinite ammo, infinite everything, you know. Uh, I always say that the biggest, and we always say, the biggest mistake of UN was the arms embargo. Many countries donated to us, from Middle Eastern countries to Western countries, everyone donated to us. It's just that the weapon, weapons couldn't come because of the UN. So sometimes UN we call like UN, united for nothing, yeah. uh -huh. or like UN uninvolved. So my big question is, uh -huh. if there was so much superior power all around here, why didn't they just take the city? I mean, there wasn't that much resistance in the beginning, right? Yes, uh, well, at the beginning, the goal was to kill us psychologically. That's why I said at the tour, like every 11th second, you hear some kind of shot and an explosion. Imagine how that affects your mentality, sure. like mental health, generally. Yeah. Even you can find videotapes of the beginning of the war where they're saying, like, the enemy soldiers are saying, shoot the random, uh, these random neighborhoods around the hills, so, so we can st stretch, I'm mean, saying literally what he said, so we can stretch their brain. Uh, that was like metaphorical mm -hmm. for like, let's, let's mess their brain up, brains up, their mental health by random shooting and all that, you know. Uh, the resistance, I always say this was the will of people. The will of people, it's always stronger than the greater evil. Ma, this, this city was one of those rare cities where all of these four religions defended the city together. You even have uh, 600, like, this was more or less like a war between Catholics, Muslims, and Christian Orthodox. But even 600 Jews died in this war uh, to defend the city. Because when the war starts, it doesn't really matter if you're Catholic, Jewish, Muslim. You have to defend your home, your neighbors, your home, your everything. And for us... It mattered. It it really it really mattered. So in essence, I mean, the war really wasn't genocide. Was as much as it was just trying to besiege the city and and yes. keep it within the Yugoslavian rule. Yes. Uh, you know, we like we have the genocide, but it's in Srebrenica. If you heard of it, uh, Srebrenica. This here, like we call the Srebrenica, like uh, in Srebrenica, that mass killing is. We call it as the genocide because people literally in 20 days killed over 9,000 people in 20 days. Which is mad, that's like 500 people per day. Yeah. Here, it, like, it's pretty bad, but it's not really in the vocabulary of genocide. Because here 11,000 were killed in like 4 years. Four years. years. And that, that was over there, it was like 9,000 in 20 days, yeah. you know. So, so, but still it's pretty bad because over 1,500 like thousand people were 50 
not 50, 50,000 people, sorry, 50,000 people were wounded. I have a neighbor, for example, a lot of people think, wow, they were not that, that's it. You know those artilleries? Those artilleries, they hit the ground, you have fragments. A lot of people, the fragment goes through the knee. You lose the leg. I actually have a veteran, he's my neighbor, he lost the leg that way. Just by accident, literally, the, the little fragment fell through his knee, immediately that's amputation, actually. But yeah, you can see it was pretty, pretty hard. At the end, the war, when it ended, the genocide in Srebrenica actually happened. That was the betrayal, we consider that as the betrayal of the UN and the whole Europe woke up in that sphere. Uh, like, wow, this is happening, happening in the heart of Europe for letting this happen. So then the NATO and the Americans came with their jets and they bombed the positions around so they suppressed uh, you know the boat like this kind of side and then uh, at the end it was uh, we had to sign the peace treaty peace agreement and all that and the war stopped the first agreement was in Washington it was ceasefire agreement mm -hmm. the second one was in Dayton Dayton agreement which made this political system uh, like so the governments really, and all that. So it was really the Allied forces like the UK, yes, US, France, and stuff that, yes. that okay. Uh, they had to intervene. Sure. Sometimes we see that it's pretty bad how they didn't intervene earlier. earlier. If even like, like it's, like a lot of people will say here it was even not their job. Like it's not America's job, for example, to be the police in the world, if we're gonna be honest. Uh, but we just hate this embargo that they did on arms. If they didn't do embargo, probably this all wouldn't even happen. Even the, the NATO wouldn't need to intervene and all that. Hmm. <laughs>
statistics and then we'll continue. You can see four months and four days were needed for the tunnel. And just to let you know, when they, they were digging the tunnel, they dug the tunnel from both sides. Mm -hmm. Even though we had the war and all that, we still had they measured the everything. And literally, imagine how correct they were, precise. They actually found themselves on the hull. Me, Wait. each other. Three ships. What else GPS? <laughs> yeah, no GPS, no technology. Yeah, just paper and the pen. Literally, the biggest massacre the big, that happened from one of those from one of those, 300 of those fell in the city, one of those killed 68 people that was the biggest massacre on the green market, all of people died because they were waiting on the land for bread actually, and you know, it exploded and it did it. And the buildings were just burned because you really couldn't do anything about it, right? There were so many of them. Yeah, 60% of buildings got burned, just like the city hall and everything. But as you can see how people are improvising, I really like to mention this kind of example because this car is actually from my neighborhood. It's so interesting that, that I read this like a few years. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you Peglitza. But it's actually, it's pretty similar to Hugo, but this is Fiat okay. from Italy. But you see this Meitage, that's my neighborhood I told you about, Meitage. Uh, you can see how people, literally from the engine of the car, yeah. they made the electricity. Literally the generator, yes. Literally the generator. When the tunnel was dug, we finally even started to get some fuel and all that through the tunnels. So this was mostly used for the hospital from secondary. But you can see here the exhaust yeah. and everything. <laughs> it's, it's engineering, literally engineering, you know. Those stoves were a big thing because those stoves worked on the wood so at the same time they were like heaters but at the same time you could cook actually with them. So they were the big part of, of, of the <laughs> Do you know the idea, idea how the tunnel runs below the airport? This would be our side. This would be the other side of the city. The Dobrinja. That's Dobrinja. This is how the neighborhood was called. You can see how it It was three shifts a day. Three shifts a day. No tools. Shovel, pickaxe. That's all you have. And you got rocks. And you got so yeah, rocks. <laughs> These rocks, like the soil from the tunnel we used for building the trenches from here to the to that free Bosnian territory. You probably saw in the video how people are running through the trenches and all of that. That's actually because even this part was not that safe. You always maybe had some kind of bullet that would go through and all that. So it, it was something to think about, you know. 
Uh, the, even the supplies were mostly they got here during the night. They would turn on the headlights on the car and bring it here. Actually, this army we got spontaneously. We were under pressure to make some kind of unit. So they just uh, organized themselves? Yes, I mean, not immediately, of course. Some time was needed for us to get the idea of this time. Uh -huh. Who is the leader? This is the leader. Oh. Oh, he's over here, actually. Alia Izabekovic. Not the Walter. <laughs> not the Walter, <laughs> not the Walter. <laughs> yeah. Oh. He is actually uh, considered even as the fir first president of oh. Bosnia. First president of Bosnia. Like Walter of Bosnia. In residency. This is how one general's room would look like. stuff in the crate and bring it from Rose. one side to the other then to carry it like others in, in on the back. Wounded, wounded people always got the right of passage from the top. Uh, it was actually quite important for wounded people to, yeah. to survive. You know? before but we had so many like uh, like so many like so much rain we had so much rain that now the town is collapsing a little bit so it's not that much safe for the for the visiting so they're restoring it again they're building the okay. uh, the supports for the tunnel mm -hmm. and <coughs> This room, it's more like the exhibition of the weaponry and the uniforms that were used during, during the last war. What they did with this weapon. Well, a pipe at some time. That's a right, water pipe. Literally, <laughs> nobody actually recognizes it. <laughs> but literally, we have to fix our weapons if the barrel goes or something like that. Just put the water pipe. And you also, uh, again, have the barrel. <laughs> you can find a lot of, in the antique stores, uh -huh. you can find a lot of, like, shotguns that were made out of water pipes and stuff like that. It's literally just because people had no other choice. Right. And even that was pretty dangerous because you never know if, oh, yeah. if the, the, the shotgun that you engineered is, yeah. yeah, if it's gonna explode in your arms and all that, you know. But as you can see, one of the first weapons were also used, these, and these were hunting rifles, actually. They were the ones that actually, that decided to, to allow this tunnel to be built. Yeah, it's to on be, their land? Yes, to be on their land. Literally, this is their house. Okay. Oh. This is their house, but now it's a museum, of course. Mm -hmm. This was their house in those times. While they moved yeah, out, they you, you gave this for the purpose of of learning the mistakes from the past, more or less, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, but they knew the risk. 
they knew the risk. If, if they find them, if, if something wrong they happens to them, then it'll be killed. For the first, yeah, they would be the first ones. So we All the victims. Oh, you can see that even someone from my family died in those times. It's so interesting. And you don't know this person? Huh? How would you pronounce this? Signify the representation of the rose that I showed you in the city. Thank you.